Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. With me today is Bill Cohen. He is from the Cohen Caregiving Support Consultants, and he is going to not only tell the story of his mom, but we're also going to talk about some tips and advice for those of us that might be at the earlier stages of the disease and or caregiving. So thanks for joining me, Bill. Yeah, I've been very excited to be able to join you today. Thank you. Awesome. So you ended up caring for your mom. So why don't we start with that story? Because it is, I'm assuming it's very interesting. You've just told me tidbits though. Mm -hmm. And it's such a story that if you had told me 16, 17 years ago, what was going to transpire? And I was going to end up sitting here talking to you today and doing what I do now. I'd say you're crazy. You couldn't make up this scenario. So, I mean, we were just talking before we uh, started this, that, you know, about making plans, right? You know, yep. surprises. So I'm working full time here in Portland, Oregon area. My mom was living in Biloxi, Mississippi, and she'd been living there almost 30 years. So around 2004, we started to notice something was off. Something was wrong. We didn't know what. But she wasn't taking care of the finances. She wasn't taking care of the house. Uh, she was showing some signs of confusion, mood swings, and, and that type of thing. She was also in the caregiving role herself for my late stepfather. We had all kinds of conditions. He was actually on and off a hospice. So we were wondering if... He passed away or went into a care community. Would mom, Sheila, bounce back? We never got that opportunity. What happened in August 2005, 16 years ago this past month, on the Gulf Coast? A little wind or some rain or something? Yeah, Hurricane <laughs> Katrina. And the storm surge was so bad on the back bay of Biloxi that it swept her house away. She fully expected to come back to that house. And the trauma of seeing it gone accelerated and exacerbated her condition. So she was safe. She had evacuated, but she ended up moving out uh, to other, with our stepfamily to North Carolina with my stepfather. And I started doing the cross-country caregiving and visiting with her, taking care of some of her medical and legal things. Uh, I started attending a support group, started talking to a care community here in Portland that I eventually wanted to move to. And she did end up staying for a couple of years also with her sister in Delray Beach, Florida. Moved her out here in 2008. It was about five years, uh, about a year in assisted living and then four years in memory care. And she passed away eight and a half years ago at age 83. Mm -hmm. So, and then with me, after that, you know, with most people when they are caregivers, when they're done, I've done my thing. I'm exhausted. I need to yep. take care of myself and would walk away and say, I'm finished. Well, I kept going to that support group. Make a long story short, I became the facilitator. I'm still <laughs> facilitating 16 years from when I started and doing the volunteer work, including the walked into Alzheimer's. And I was remarking about your beautiful farmer's garden behind you. I carry the purple flower from my mother and other fundraising and advocacy of the Capitol. But as I approached retirement from my state job after 25 years, I thought I was just going to do more volunteer work. I came across this concept of caregiving support consultant, which we can talk about more. But essentially what happened was I turned my personal loss, my pain into my passion and my encore career. That sounds familiar. And I laugh because I also still attend my support group. I did miss last night because it was my anniversary. Mm -hmm. And I'm a little bit more hit and miss these days just because it's it's getting a little old to have to do it on Zoom. But I am able to give a lot of good advice because I talk to so many people like yourself that they have asked me if I would do the facilitator training. Yeah. So I'm like, oh no, I'm following in his footsteps. Probably would be very good. Um, they they wanted me to do it here because we are probably more than like it's the plan is to move about two hours away. Mm -hmm. um, I have not heard back from the gal who's in charge of the training. 
So I might have to nudge that. We'll see what happens. I did tell them I will be coming back to this city regularly for my hair appointment. I can manage to coordinate those together. My daughter will still live here. So I'm not like mm -hmm. abandoning town and never coming back. But I do see a need up there because everybody I know that's moving up there doesn't happen to be that young. <laughs> They're not old yet, but you know, we're all in our 50s, 60s. So it's... um something for them to think about. So I don't, I don't know where that's going yet. But and there were, just, there were very, a lot fewer support groups back then. The one I went to that continued was the only one at that time in the evening during the week rather than is, during the week because I was working. I needed that. And then I started another group for a nonprofit uh, across the river, Vancouver, Washington. Started the first one south of the Columbia River. And I, that's a weekly one. And I've been doing that one for about four years. And then I have a Facebook community, Dementia Support Group for Caregivers with Bill Cohen. And I have a monthly virtual support group for that one. And even though we're going shifting back and forth between in-person and virtual or hybrid, that one will continue to be virtual because I get people from all over the country uh, joining me for that one. There are people in my group that have said weekly would be, would be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, right now, I mean, my group, when we were in person, there was one time there was almost 35 of us, which was like, ugh. You know, you walk in, you're like, I'm so glad all these people are here, and I'm so unhappy that all these people have to be here. That's a, it was, that's it was definitely a... That's too large. That's a too large a group for... Because uh, nobody really gets a chance to share as much as they really need That's to. true. Mm -hmm. But on um, virtual, it's it's been about the same three or four people, and some people need... Weekly might help. And some people, I think, need grief support because I'm not the only one that's post-caregiving. But, you know, when you lose somebody during the pandemic, like, I'm going to a funeral tomorrow and the following Saturday, and yet my mom has had nothing. No celebration of life, no nothing. She's not been interred with my dad. I mean, it's just, like, yeah. so irritating. And weekly, me feel and weekly is nice because if you miss one, there's another one the following week. Yeah, uh, a month well, is a long ways away. A long time. In between, but regardless, the bottom line is that a support group provides advice, support, knowing you're not alone, a lot of good information. I just love how the people in all my groups will help each other out, and it really becomes a community and extended family and friends. Yeah, Some that's people, why I wish because they, they meet for many years. It becomes almost like their social group, and even if somebody again is is in bereavement, and those groups aren't for that, but you can help others go through it like others helped me as well and probably helped you so you can even if you don't become a facilitator you can help others through their own journeys because of your own experience and i've learned so much from and all these podcast interviews i'm still learning things it always blows my mind just recorded one a few days ago and this gal had a suggestion i was like nobody said that <laughs> and i'm a photographer i never thought of that oh yeah yeah so I feel like if I'm still learning things, then my listeners are learning things. And for better or worse, there's still a lot to to learn. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to throw out... I don't try to pretend to know everything in my groups or even my clients. Some of the best ideas come from the other caregivers. Absolutely. And I think that's how you get the best ideas is being open to, to knowing you don't know it all. Mm -hmm. So what is your opinion... Like early on in the symptoms of dementia, they're normally, they're fairly manageable early on. Mm -hmm. So what, what do you suggest a care partner? How can they prepare themselves for the challenges that lies ahead? Because I, I have seen a lot of people, they're like, oh, this isn't that bad. This is manageable. And, you know, two, three, five years down the road, they're, they're, they're sinking. They're up to their neck in quicksand and they don't know how to get out. So how can we help people prevent that? That's, and that is a dilemma. And it's actually a two-edged sword because there's some aspects that may be more manageable. But some people, persons living with dementia in the early stages, actually can be more difficult because they're in denial or they're fighting it uh, or you haven't maybe gotten a handle on the behaviors or medications to, to take care of anxiety or depression or agitation mood swings and things like that. So, and some people become more manageable as things go along, 
because ignorance is bliss. They get to a yes. point where they don't, they don't fight it. They don't know how, what's happening to them. But going back to the beginning is that in some aspects, it is more manageable because if you are calm, keep them active, try to keep things as normal as possible. A lot of their favorite activities or hobbies or interests, they're still the same person. They're still there inside. And it just may take them a little longer. They may not do it the way you would do it. You got to let that stuff go. <laughs> Don't try to correct them. I'm sure we, most of us have heard that. And just to think in terms of uh, positive interactions, uh, there's a term from a caregiving course. Have you heard of the uh, savvy caregiver classes yep. at Emory University? I, so you well, I took, I took savvy caregiver through the Alzheimer's Association mm -hmm. in 2019. Okay. Yeah. So my mom was at the end of her end of the stages by that point. So I always tell people if they're early on, learn as much as you can. Yes. I think sometimes we, we would like to have ignorance as bliss because we really don't want to know what the end is like because it's not pretty, but that's not going to serve you. So mm -hmm. That's always my suggestion. Yeah, it's a very similarly. I was going to just say the term would be contented involvement to give them things to do that they would still enjoy doing. It just may take them a little longer and simplify it, set them up for success, break it into simple steps and uh, so they don't get frustrated at time, or mess it up completely where you know they don't want to do it anymore. But to look at not only for them with activities and not just rely upon TV, don't let them just sit there, but keep them at mentally active, socially active, physically active. Get them walking, bring them to a senior center, bring them to an adult daycare or a, a respite, uh, that type of thing. Still see their friends and, as long, and let them know what's going on so they can interact and be patient. Because if they're trying to do like they've always done, you know, what's wrong with him or they may end up not wanting to be around that type of thing. So it, not only do we have to educate ourselves. And the Alzheimer's Association, as you, I'm sure you've pointed out, has some wonderful resources, classes, things online, et cetera. Um, but also let family, friends, neighbors, church, ex-coworkers know what's going on. Say, don't try to correct them. Don't say, you know, don't you remember? Just talk slowly, patiently, expect those repeated questions. Re expect those mood swings, knowing that they're going to come be prepared for it. You don't necessarily have to react. You don't even necessarily have to answer, but be prepared for it and know that they're coming. Don't be surprised. I like the term, the uh, the approach, and maybe you've uh, used it or heard of it. Is use improv. Yeah, I need to. I need to find an improv professional. You've reminded me. I've got two people to ask because I think that would be a really fun episode, and I think it would be really good training because I'm always way too much in my head, yeah. even though I'm half artist the practical side of me just had a really hard time with that and i really really wish i'd learned that so that's mm -hmm. that's hopefully for season five but Here, here's my here's my example of that so mom's favorite question was partly because i could, wouldn't take her to any more movies the last time we <laughs> went she spent half the time in the bathroom oh yeah <laughs> she would ask are there any good movies out there or can we go see a movie so I would just say is any movie that popped in my head, Titanic, Casablanca, whatever, it didn't matter. One, she, how old it was. She, one, she was getting an answer. Two, it did no harm. Three, she didn't know any difference. Four, I'm keeping my, san in, my sanity inside. And yeah. five, I'm having a little laugh inside at mom's expense. <laughs> it worked. didn't have to... Didn't have to take her to see these movies that weren't in yeah. the theater. Yeah, and she'd be getting an ad. Oh, okay, we'll go see that soon. Yep, we'll go soon, Mom. Yeah, maybe next week. So that's where I always got myself tripped up because I would probably, I would answer, and I would mm -hmm. answer as truthfully as possible, or I might say something like, you know, there really aren't any good movies lately. That's really a bummer. Anything that would maybe discourage her from wanting to go. That was where the practical side of me was like, uh-oh, last time we went to the movies, it wasn't great. Not mm. only was the movie movie horrible, mm. but it wasn't one that you wanted to go sit with your parents and watch. If you guys get my drift, <laughs> it's a little too much 
And yeah, I didn't want to go there with my I mom. I think the so. other the other aspect to answer your question too is yes, some aspects are easier earlier on because there's still some physical ability, mental ability to do normal things. But the blunt statement is our question is, do you think it's going to get any easier? We know that we can't fix it. We know that there is no cure or treatment yet. We're getting closer. I know you've had guests on that have talked about the advances, which is wonderful. I think we're in an exciting historic time in terms of that. But it's it's going to be, get more difficult. It's not a matter. You don't want to have to react in a crisis. You don't want to have to, because it's going to be emotional. You're going to have fewer options. Plan, prepare, be proactive, and know that these things are coming. And that goes back to learn as much as you can about what to expect. I pretty much would say, oh, this is happening now. Okay. Next. <laughs> Next. Yeah. You know, okay, I'm dealing with this now. Let's I'll I'll see what's coming up next. And I'd see those behaviors, and it wasn't as much of a surprise. I'd have a better idea of what to expect. Still hard, still gut wrenching, still emotional. This is my mother. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And and, I, and it's not better or worse or harder or easier. It's just different. Think about a spouse, a partner, and how hard that is to lose the most intimate relationship. And you have gone to from spouse or partner, husband or wife. To caregiver, I can't imagine going through that. It was hard enough with my mom. Yeah, definitely. I was I was really blessed. My dad was a buffer. My mom had Alzheimer's for at least twenty years, mm. and I only really had to deal substantially in the last three or four mm. after he passed away. It was three from when he passed away, but and he didn't really want the two of us daughters to help, which was frustrating because he needed it. He had his own chronic illnesses Mm -hmm. and he had zero patience, which never helped because she'd ask the question the second time and he'd snap at her and then she'd get mad and snap at him. I got like cats Mm -hmm. fighting in the fight. And you can't really tell your father that doesn't work. Can't you see this is not working? You know, because that's not not really going to help either. So it was just, it was really hard. But you could set an example uh, and show how I, how you interact, how you handle her, how you handle the person living with dementia, and hopefully, but again, especially other people who like other family members or friends, when you come over, this will be the best way to interact with them. Just talk about old memories, ask them questions about home or uh, what trips do you remember, things like that, which just goes back to the old thing about if they're all upset about something like, I want to go home. Well, tell me about home because it may not be the last home they were living in. It may have been where they raised the family. It might have been where they grew up. So ask, so where's home? Tell me about that. What would you do if you went there type of thing? Said, okay, well, let's go have lunch first and then maybe we can uh, go swing by the house. By the time lunch is over, gone. Yeah, my mom never asked that question, but there were other residents where she lived that did. Oh, yeah, yeah. And sometimes they'd beg me. I must. I must. Look, I don't know if I looked like a sympathetic soul or a patsy, but they'd be <laughs> like, "Can you take me home?" And it'd be like, "Uh, uh." Right, right, and right. so I, so it's kind of in a similar nature to having to deal with my mom if she'd asked that question. Was I had to answer it for them? And obviously, I couldn't really take them anywhere. I did. My mom had friends in memory care, and it for a while was actually easier to take out both Diane's, my mom and her friend. <laughs> there was three of them, Diane, other Diane, and other, other Diane. And if you don't think that's confusing, well, more power to you, because it was very confusing. <laughs> Especially when you talk to my mom about her friends, you couldn't refer to them by their name because it confused her. It was just, it was like just a joke. But it was easier to take them out in the earlier days when my mom lived there. Mm-hmm. And these other residents that I didn't have like a relationship with, they would be like, sometimes they'd grab me and say, can you take me home? I need to go home. And I'm like, ah! <laughs> it's like panic. So I learned that home is not necessarily a physical place. It's a feeling of security, familiarity, you know, things that are very difficult to give to them because their brain is not giving them security and, and stability and nice feelings. So that's the one thing that I like to tell people is, you know, that might be what they're looking for. And then I always say, 
but then say, oh, but we should have lunch first. And then if you have lunch and they're still asking, okay, well, we need to do blah, blah, blah. Or hopefully they ask close to dinner and then you can say, oh, well, it's too dark. Let's go in the morning. So, yeah, a lot of that distraction stuff. And this is the kind of a controversial area in terms of some people say, oh, I can never lie to them. Or well, I'm not going to lie to uh, to the people. I always want to tell them the truth. And, and, and some pl- people in, in, in nursing homes or care communities, et cetera, are taught that don't lie. And, you know, some people use the term, you know, therapeutic or white lies, whatever. I, prefer, and I know it's not universal, compassionate deception. Oh, I like that term. I've heard a lot of them, but I haven't heard that one. Yeah. Well, in, in Again, is there a, if it's not causing any harm and it helps keep them calmer and you're not just, you're not telling the whole truth, shall we say. Like when after the hurricane, I had to take mom to the hospital to get her on some meds because she was just completely agitated. Said, so, oh, mom, we're going to go see a new doctor tomorrow. Oh, okay. I was taking her to the ER. <laughs> Would she have gone if I had told her the truth? No. Not willingly. <laughs> no, not willingly, but I, I was going to drag my mother there, right? So she went willingly. She wasn't thrilled about being there once we got there. But <laughs> ended up being, she ended up being like a caged animal. We were in the ER for like 10 hours. Oh, no, 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 but no. But once she got admitted overnight and got on some medication the next morning, I get off the elevator. She says, there you are. Where have you been? My savior. She wasn't must mad. have been a nice moment. Yeah, it was. Because it was the worst night of my life. But that made it worthwhile. Yeah, there are some there are some silver linings. You've got to look hard for them. When it and comes to the... Right, it's challenging. It's emotional. But in other ways, it's gratifying. Well, going back to the compassionate deception, I have... Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you've experienced this, but a lot of the younger, I hate this term, got to come up with a better one, adult child caregivers, so like you and I, mm-hmm. they really don't want to lie to mom, especially right. the female caregivers like myself and the younger ones seem, I don't know, I don't know how this got beaten into their head so much more than mine because you didn't lie to my mother, <laughs> but they don't want to, they, they, they feel really bad about it. And there was a conversation online one day where they're like, what do you do, you know, if they ask about somebody who's deceased? Mm -hmm. And so I had to go, I went and told the entire story about my dad. So I already said my dad had no patience. And sometimes my parents fought like, you know, two cats and he was never fun. So my mom would say things like, well, she, she thought I was her best friend. Mm-hmm. And for those people who might be new, haven't heard this story before, I was almost 100% certain she didn't remember our relationship because I'd lost 100 pounds. I did not look like the person that I remembered. So if I looked in the mirror or at photographs and went, whoa, you can only imagine somebody in the later stages of dementia or Alzheimer's. They're like, who the heck are you? You're not my daughter. You look nothing like her, which right. you know was true. So I confirmed that she didn't remember our relationship when I showed up on my birthday, which I've said is in November and the um, care community she lived in was having a, the family family harvest celebration for Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. And I showed up and I told her that it was a special day and they were having a party. And did she remember why November 17th was special? No. Oh, well, it's my birthday. Oh, really? I'm like, yeah, no, this woman does not remember that I am her daughter. Okay. Yeah. Confirmation that's confirmed. Yeah, that's stuff with your mom. Doesn't remember your birthday. Mm-hmm. Fortunately, I mean, it's stung a little bit, but I think because, I don't know, maybe a subconscious voice had told, I knew, but that I, that was just confirmation. So mm-hmm. she thought I was her best friend and I would show up to take her out to uh, watch kids, which everybody knows that's what we did. <laughs> mm-hmm. And she, she would say, have you seen my husband? Uh, no. Mm-hmm. Where'd he go? Oh, I don't know. I haven't seen him for a while. And I'm thinking in the back of my head, oh, yeah, maybe like a year plus because he's been dead. Mm. Um, But I never, ever told her that he was gone. And that was the one place where I did pretty good with improv, but I wasn't super creative. Mm -hmm. I always went and visited her after our Rotary meeting. Mm. And my dad was a Rotarian. So I'd be like, oh, oh, he was at the Rotary meeting. And then he said he was going to go whatever to the doctor, whatever. He's off on a business trip. Yeah, I did say that occasionally. One time she said, did you see him? And I said, no, do we need to go find him? She's like, no. (laughs) I'm like, okay. (laughs) 
And so that was about the only conversation that I had that was definite baloney. And I never felt bad about it, except for that sometimes it hurt because it's like, and it'd be really nice to reminisce about my dad with my mother, but that ain't mm -hmm. going to happen. So it did happen once. Yeah. And I don't know about your family, but with my family, we always had those important phone, or phone calls, conversations in the car when you're trapped. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And literally we're driving down the road and she starts talking about my dad. So, oh, it was so sad when your father died. And I was like, wow, almost crashed because it yeah. was so shocking. And it literally lasted two minutes. And then she told me how beautiful the sky was. And I'm like, well, that was over. So in three years, no, one was... time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was really straight. I'm like, I really wish you hadn't hit me out of the blue with them. <laughs> so, so I like to also use the, uh, the takeoff on the uh, Maya Angelou that, you know, they may not remember your exact name. They may not remember the exact relationship. How do you make them feel? My mom never got upset when she saw me like, ah, eh, who are you? It was that recognition, some affection, some love. However, she was always a little confused in later years about the exact relationship because she always had one uh, dominant male figure in her life, my grandfather, my biological father, my stepfather, and then it became me. And then she would sometimes get a little confused because, again, I don't look like little Billy anymore. No. <laughs> <laughs> and you can't call me Billy. <laughs> she could. That. She would sometimes pat the bed and say, are you staying here tonight? No, mom. <laughs> I had to actually stop calling her mom because she would ask me, we'd be leaving the care home. Mm -hmm. and, and it was always this tone of voice. Does my husband know where we're going? Yeah. Yes, mom. Dad knows where we're going. And there was literally, it had, I cannot tell you, this is embarrassing, how many months it took before the lightning bolt finally struck my brain in the right spot. I literally walked so her room was on the opposite side of the building from the exit so mm. from her room to the exit she asked me that question three times we get and so then there was like a little lobby we, you know you have the, the locked doors and then the lobby and then the door to the outside so literally between her room and my car she asked me that question five times by the time i got to the car i wasn't sure if i wanted to slam her head into the trunk or mine or both <laughs> or something i was like I've been with this woman 10 minutes. I'm done. You know, I'm like, I can't do this. And all of a sudden the light bulb finally went on. I'm like, duh, I am not answering this woman's question. She's asking, does my husband know where I am going? So when I say, yes, mom, dad knows where we're going. That is not the answer to the question. Mm -hmm. Duh. <laughs> it's like, mm -hmm. I'm a little slow sometimes, but, and then once I finally said, oh yeah, he, whatever. And as soon as I started answering her as her friend, mm -hmm. She stopped asking me that question every two minutes, which was a very big blessing. And I was very mad at myself for not realizing mm -hmm. sooner. Or maybe I was, say, I'll, I'll give him a call and make sure he knows and reassure him. Because so, if that's what was bothering her, if that's what was upsetting her, that he may not know. What, what she was worried about was that he wouldn't know where she was going and he'd be angry because she wasn't where he thought she should be. That was the situation. Because mm -hmm. uh, that's why it was always that kind of snarky tone of voice. So it was like, ugh. <laughs> but um, there was one other thing I was going to say, oh, about the feeling, giving them the sense of feeling. So as long as the weather was reasonable, and even sometimes when it wasn't great, we'd go to the library, but we always went someplace where we could watch kids. Thankfully, most of the time it was the park. And most of the time since I'm in Northern California, that wasn't terribly difficult. But I had been, this was 2019. So this was literally two years ago. My husband and I had flown home from Colorado. Anybody flown through Denver knows, never get through there on time. <laughs> we didn't leave on time. So we got home at like one o'clock in the morning. Now I am a complete daytime person. Sun up, I'm awake. Sun down, I am asleep. This I'm solar charged. This is my husband's joke. <laughs> so I thought I'm a little tired. So I'm just going to take my wedding album. My mom, because my dad was a photographer, it was his assistant that did our wedding. She's totally familiar with it, although she totally forgot all the people that were in the book. I just brought it to share with her just for fun, not to go down memory lane because that didn't work with her. I show up and she goes, oh, hi, where are we going today? And I was like, oh, crud. <laughs> <laughs> Dang it. But one day I don't take her out. She, I'm like, now how? I've been doing this for two years, over two years. 
How does she remember that we go someplace all the time? She has no clue who I am. I just don't understand. Mm -hmm. We had a very nice visit. She loved looking through the wedding album. Some of the care staff, the people that were more in charge of her than others, enjoyed looking at it. Because I, yeah, I got married in 1989. Pink mm -hmm. wedding dress, lots of poof and ruffles, very 80s. Okay. So, you know, people enjoyed it. And, and she enjoyed their enjoyment. So it was actually a really nice visit. But it all came back to when she saw me, she knew I was the fun person. I'm like, I like that. I'll take it. I'll be the fun friend. You know, she may not remember my name or our relationship, but I'll take fun friend any day of the week. Mm -hmm. and so it, it, it does matter. And it, a lot of people, I mean, I took her to the regional park in 2018. We'd walk in the regional park. She'd try to avoid shadows. That was always fun. And I took her friend once. It took both Diane's to the regional park and people are like, and you brought them back. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I brought them back. There are rangers there. You know, they didn't yeah. see my car. <laughs> like, uh, I had to bring them back to the care home. But, you know, it just I just gave her as much quality of life as I could. And I hope in the interim, that I also taught people that it, it was a little challenging. But once we got to the park or to the pool, it, was, it wasn't so bad. Because I could answer emails on my phone or, mm -hmm. you know, scroll through Instagram or just put my head back and listen to the kids screaming and laughing and the birds chirping and just sun on my face. It was just, it was just a moment of like calm, which was kind of necessary after getting her in and out of the car and making sure she knew where her husband knew her husband knew where she was. Right. <laughs> it was crazy. So since I was the fun friend kind of leads me into this other question, how can a friend or a family member support a loved one who has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's? Like my mom had a friend. I really never understood this. My mom was in the service organization. This gal would pick my mom up. They'd go to the meeting. And then this gal would take my mom and do errands. And sometimes they wouldn't get back till late afternoon, like bordering on early evening. And I have no idea how she put up with my mother for that many hours. Because, <laughs> you know, you go into a Target or even a grocery store. And there's so many people and so much stuff. And it's it's crazy. Like it's if you stop old. and look at it, it's, it's a lot. And if your brain can't process fast enough, I can only imagine what some of those places feel like to people who are cognitively in challenged, like somebody who's autistic or somebody who's uh, anxiety or somebody who's got Alzheimer's. So what would you suggest for friends on how they can help support like people like us and our loved one? Well, let's, let's go back to first family is that a lot of family feel, well, well, I can't do the carry and I can't do this, I can't do that. There are a lot of ways that family can support and do things. And my family definitely did that. Uh, they certainly had uh, their opinions, and, but my name was on the power of attorney and et cetera. So I had the final say, they always had mom's best interest. But like I had a cousin who helped with her computer stuff. I had my, uh, another relative may help with the medical bills or the finances or to do research. Somebody else could do ordering. There's a lot of different things that they can do. It doesn't have to be the hands-on. It might be, and this can go now blending over into friends or neighbors or what have you. Give them a break for a couple of hours. Let them go get a massage. Let them go get their hair done. Go have coffee with a friend. That is gold to a caregiver. And I, I think I was mentioning about the savvy caregiving classes. We actually have people envision if you had two hours with no obligations of caregiving, four hours, a full day, a long weekend, what would you do? I've had some people say, I can't envision that because I can't see myself taking it or getting it. But the idea of the exercise is that you start thinking about, I want to do those things. I want to go to a spa for a day. And you will find a way to make that time available. And it might be asking, if not demanding, <laughs> like say, an, uh, a relative, a cousin, somebody, I need a break. I'm going to get sick if I don't. Can you please watch so-and-so for the rest of, for one day or a few hours? This is very important and I'd be really appreciative. The other thing, I think it comes down to asking. And some, and other times it has to be the others thinking, I, people never know exactly what to do, right? Right. You know, if you need anything, let me know, blah, blah, so forth. And you don't know what to do. Sometimes you just have to do it, bring them a meal, 
so they don't have to cook that night. Go, just drop by and say, get out of here. Go do whatever you want. I'll be, I'll, I'll watch Bob for two hours. That type of thing. Um, I like to use this one example. It's a, it's a, it's a lighter version of what we're talking about. Mom's in the last couple of weeks. She's on hospice. I'm taking turns with my aunt and she leaves. It's first thing in the morning. And I put it out on sales on Facebook. Could somebody please bring me a mocha? <laughs> two different friends showed up from two different uh, coffee stands. Nice. Two different ones. Yeah. All, sometimes all you had to do was ask. Because well, people I have a, want to help, I have they a, know what you're going through. And if they true. don't, they should. <laughs> well, you have to educate them. But here's my, here's what I tell people to do. Make a list of everything. Like, you're gonna, this, good, this is like a little bit of a long-term assignment. Make a list of everything you have to do every day. So you do that for a week. Now you know every day, these are the things I do. Then add in the stuff that you do weekly, monthly, and maybe the random stuff. Doc like my mom didn't have to go to the doctor real regularly, so those were generally complete schedule disruptors, but they were, they were random. Now you have a list of like all the stuff you have to do. It has nothing to, not necessarily, it doesn't, it's not all about the caregiving. Now make a list of everybody you know and write down what they're good at. You know, like my husband used to be in banking. He is now a real estate broker. That man does contracts. He can stand on hold forever. He can speak bank speak, insurance person speak. I'm on hold for two minutes and my blood pressure is... And then somebody asked me some inane question I don't understand and now I'm just super irritated. I cannot handle those phone calls. I do not know why, but I'm just not good at them. And even though he was not legally able to talk to the banks, the insurance company, he would call, deal with all the minutia, all the hold, and, and then they'd be like, oh, we're not supposed to be talking to you. Then he'd put me, on, he'd put the phone on speakerphone, and then the two of us would talk to these people. And they always, okay, I always had to jump through the hoops that, yes, I know it's on speakerphone. And yes, I know my husband is sitting in the room. And yes, it's okay. <laughs> Stop asking me these yep. questions. Yep. <laughs> but I mean, I understood all that. I understood that was for my protection. So it, it was mildly annoying. But then, you know, like if somebody comes up and says, oh my gosh, I'm really sorry. Your mom's got Alzheimer's. Is there anything I can do to help? <laughs> yes, <laughs> you can do X. Can right. you call the insurance company for me? Because I just can't deal with that. Mm -hmm. And and if it's in their wheelhouse and they're not like helping your mom bathe or do something kind of icky that they probably don't want to do, right. then, you know, now you've taken that stress off of you. Because trust me, I tried really hard to learn how to just deal with it. Never worked. Still don't like it. You know, and you could say, or somebody might say, my son's got to do some community service hours for graduation. Great. I don't know that this would work most places, but, you know. Find out if mowing, you know, helping me with the yard, if that would, you know, if we go and, you know, get that signed off, it, it would be a little bit of work. But there's always something somebody can help you with, like bringing you the mocha. But if you have an answer to, is there anything I can do to help other than, oh, no, I'm okay right now. Thanks. Right. No, don't answer that. Have a list. And then your brain is primed right. for when they ask that. Or you could be like, I am so confused about setting up this online banking or whatever. It's been so long since I did that. I can't remember if it was a challenge for me. I'm going to ask the grandkid or whomever if they can help with that. And then it just mm -hmm. takes away a stress. And then it gives you more time also to deal with your loved one. And you're not trying to find somebody else to do those things. So again, that's what I suggest. And again, if it's getting too much, probably going to need to look at bringing some some aids obviously it's been a challenge during covid but once things open up again i highly suggest don't try to do it all yourself you need to uh, bring in help and take some of the load off you because if you don't you're going to get burned out you're going to get sick or worse i'm sure you've shared the statistics about how often uh caregivers predecease uh mm -hmm. the person living with dementia and it's tragic and unavoidable well, it's also not a fun crisis to live through. And I can attest to that because that's exactly what happened. We showed up at my parents' house. I was just past my 50th birthday. We showed up to put up Christmas decorations, spend the afternoon together. My husband walks in the door first. My dad goes, oh, hi, 
hi, how's it going? How's the credit union business treating you? My husband was like, holy <laughs> crap. I have not been in the credit union business in 13 years. What is going on? Now, had I known what was going on, and had he talked to me a little bit more openly, I would have just called hospice. Because then we spent the next 32 days of him in the hospital with the kidney doctor telling everybody, well, once we get, because he was diabetic and the donated kidney was failing, once we get the toxins cleaned out of his system, his memory should return. I do not know at what point she knew that that was baloney because it never happened. The best he got, and I do not know what the hospital jacked him up with, so right before they released him, he knew that he had a gap in his memory. He knew that he thought it was 1998, but it was actually 2016, 2017 almost because it was at the end of the year. And he was very anxious to fill that gap. And then after three days, he didn't even remember he had a gap. So in those 32 days, my sister and I, who are not close, do not agree on anything, do not see eye to eye, nothing, had to bounce my mom between my house and her house. My mom's youngest sister, she, my mom's the oldest of four. My mom's youngest sister took care of their grandmother who had vascular dementia. So she would come and spend two to four days with her sister before she needed to get the heck out of there. Mm -hmm. So we bounced mom between my house, her house, and my sister's house and the dog at Christmas time. You want to talk about ugly? It was ugly. And it's just like, I'm still mad at my dad for that. It's been like, you know, oh, we're getting close to four years <laughs> since he died. So we're really close to four years from when this actually all went down. Yeah. Because that conversation would have been so much easier to have. He'd been saying things like, well, I'm, I'm getting close to the end. Well, okay. You know, we all might be. We just don't know exactly when the end is. And I knew he wasn't doing super well. I did not know that he knew he was needing to be back on dialysis and he didn't want to go back on dialysis. And I, I was fine with that because that's mm -hmm. really not a way to live, just a way to maintain life. So we needed to have some of those end of life conversations because it was ugly. And yeah, important. Yeah, that's the problem is too often families don't have the discussion. They don't uh, talk about planning, preparing, being proactive, getting the legal things, getting the advanced directive in order. Uh, because if you're having to react in a crisis, uh, it just gets too emotional and expensive. It's just it, it just going to add so much more stress on on you and the family. And it's better to know your wishes, their wishes in advance, let alone your own. Uh, I love to give the example of soon after she lost a home in the hurricane in North Carolina, we did her advance directive, and this was still very much in the news. That case in Florida with Terry Shivo who was in a, uh, a persistent vegetative state state, and all the politicians and the families were bottling and it was ridiculous. But I just asked mom a very simple question. Mom, do you want to end up like Terry Shivo? She still had enough cognitive ability to say, absolutely not. She knew exactly what I was talking about. We got that in writing. That was my direction. That, uh, that was my guidance. And it was actually a gift because I knew exactly what she wanted. I didn't have to worry about making any gut-wrenching decisions towards the end. So thank you, Mom, for doing that for me. <laughs> well, thankfully, my mom, in some respects, she got very combative at the end, which I like to tell people the story that when she moved in to the memory care, the caregiver was like, oh, your mom is so easy. She's so fun. And I'd always tell them, <laughs> you didn't grow up with her because obviously it's different. Mm -hmm. And... So for two-ish, a little over two years, she was easy. And she was very much a helper and a caregiver. And because she walked and talked, it was, always, it was so funny. All the people in wheelchairs and on walkers, she'd lean out her door and go, if you need anything, just let me know. I'm here to help. And oh, geez, it was so hard not to laugh at that. <laughs> like, honey, you have no clue what you're talking about. <laughs> and it was just, but it was kind of funny to sort of see like the old her. But it, you know, it was also kind of a little hard because it's like, yeah, you couldn't help that woman if you wanted to, mm -hmm. but that's how she was. And then she really had the, like almost a flip of the switch. And she just got really combative and her MO was if you pissed her off, she clawed people. She drew blood on caregivers, which I just found devastatingly embarrassing because that was not who she was. But she was fighting the care. Well, this is not what they said. They said after her shower, which took two people to do, she reached for her clothes and slipped 
and landed on her kneecap and broke her, the leg underneath the kneecap. Mm. I know for a fact, because this was my mother, that she went, then jerked away from one of them, reached for her clothes, lost her balance and fell. I know she's the reason she fell. None, no fault of the care home at all. They put up with way more nonsense. So I got to miss some of the really ugly end stages. The problem for me was that was right at the beginning of COVID. And I didn't get to see her for the last two weeks of her life. I did see her the day before she passed away. So I was very blessed because the executive director, I don't know if it was his decision. I mean, they basically closed the building to all guests, but they knew she was dying. So they said, please come. And 10 of us showed up in the hallway right after she passed away. And the poor executive director was having a complete coronary. <laughs> it was like, well, you think they'll need to leave. No one here was, the last the last week or two when mom was on hospice at her community, it was a norovirus, uh, which happens on a regular basis. But that was just one community. Now, my aunt and I were the only people besides staff and residents that were allowed in because they knew mom was really close and that was a gift i might have got a little sick from it uh but it wasn't too bad because i had a good immune system but to be able to spend those last couple of, i cannot imagine either not seeing your loved one that by the time you would see them they would remember you the dementia would advance or that they would pass away and i heard about stories like that and that is just really really sad and tragic uh, i wish we could have found a better way to handle all that i hope care homes are analyzing how to make that better. How to, I guess I just read recently that being in the hospital during the highest part of COVID did not up your rates, up your chances of getting COVID, which makes no sense to me, but mm -hmm. I'm not a medical person, nor will I ever be. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I found that article very interesting and some of it was ventilation and, and, you know, the staff is wearing masks and gloves and all that. So I'm like, okay, I think there was better ways to handle it, but it happened so fast. And one thing, because you said, you know, about the, the norovirus, my mom's community had a huge flu outbreak in the winter of 2018 to where the point where there was red signs on the door that mm. said big flu outbreak, you know, enter at your own risk. Preferably don't come in, but you can still. It got so bad that the assisted living community community that was actually they were attached to they had to close the dining room and serve everybody meals in their apartments which is what they did during covid so mm -hmm. i'm hoping the people that get paid the big bucks because we know the caregivers don't um mm -hmm. are analyzing I like, what the heck lessons Just, learned right new, yeah i mean best practices well you know unfortunately it's like okay well we can see why all those things weren't so great you know let's take the good and and let's you know it's not going to be perfect and hopefully it doesn't happen again, but maybe they can apply similar strategies to like a flu and keep it from closing the dining room. Cause my mom's community had great food and that had to be a real hassle to have to serve everybody in their, you know, their tiny little apartments and not being able to do, you know, just that isolation. No social yeah. activity. Right. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if they shut down activities or not. I know they shut down the, the dining room cause there was, because they always brought food over to memory care, mm -hmm. and that's how I found out about it. But yeah, it was the, the two weeks that I couldn't go see her. I did not go anywhere because I'm like, I'm going to stay home. I'm going to stay safe. Not go in the grocery store. Send the husband. It's fine. No another place to go anyway. <laughs> so I might as well just sit here and look at the walls and talk to people on Zoom. And after a week, I was starting to get really antsy because that was my fear is that she would forget I was her fun friend. Mm -hmm. And after 10 days, I was... I was about to get on the phone with the executive director who he has moved to a different community, but we had a very good relationship mm -hmm. and I was about to tell him I'm coming in. Do you want me to come through the window? Cause I will. <laughs> you want me to put a bag over my head? Cause I will, but I'm mm -hmm. coming in and I don't know why I hesitated. So that was day 10. So by day 14 is when they called and said, mm, mom's not doing so great. We think she'd do better with a visit from you, which and now have learned his code for, holy crap, she's going to die, come see her. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so I did. I saw her Monday, March 30th. She passed away on March 31st. They did call. The ho I had talked to the hospice nurse that morning. And then I did a recording for the podcast. And then I was having lunch and they called and they said, please come now. And so I called my daughter and my sister. My husband called my uncle who brought her, the youngest sister. And 
the four of us got there first. My sister was just minutes behind and then my aunt and uncle who are like 30 minutes away but we all missed the end which i'm okay with i've read a lot of things about what to do right after somebody passes away like don't panic don't rush to call people just sit mm -hmm. like well i didn't have that benefit i didn't have that with either parent i don't know that i'd want it but i don't know we'll see i keep and telling my I husband was, i'll out i'll outlive him <laughs> and i was the opposite i was there that night interestingly the person who was my first facilitator uh Besides my aunt leaving for the for the day and me being there, they had moved me over for the first time away from her bed to her former roommate's bed, who she was moved across the hall because they knew it was getting towards the end. And she suggested, have your brother call. Just hold the phone up to her. Let him talk. I told him, you better call tonight. She probably won't be, you know, around much longer. And don't worry about if she responds. Just talk. He calls like around 10 o'clock, whatever. I go lie in the bed about one o'clock in the morning. The heavy, raspy breathing stopped. It's quiet. And I didn't get upset. I didn't go, oh my God, mom's gone. It was like, ah, it's over. She let go. She's no longer suffering. And yes, I just let the staff know. I just sat there, let it sink in, let them do their work, started composing an email to, you know, family and friends, et cetera, to let them know what had happened. And we actually, part of the story was we had plans months ago to go to Costa Rica. We were there two days later. Mm. I have a favorite phrase that for once in her life, mom was on time. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It was always late, <laughs> always late. But this time she gave us just enough time. And it was the exact thing that we needed to recover, recuperate, grieve. You know, I still was other people and I was going out doing activities. But I sp did a lot of relaxing and just, you know, being by myself too. Yeah, we, we, need that. we need that time. And that was what was right for me. It's not maybe right for everybody. And then when we came back, we did the graveside service. And then a couple of months later, we did the memorial service. And that's what worked out for, well for our family. It may not be best for our elders. Well, going back to it, before my dad died, I went to, we went to Jamaica for my 50th birthday. I don't know what the heck possessed me. My husband and I are cyclists. I decided I was doing the Jamaican reggae ride, which is a three-day bike ride across the Jamaican islands for my 50th birthday, about four months after flying off my bike, slamming into the pavement, and breaking my collarbone, and having to have surgery to fix it. So, <laughs> why I thought that'd be fun for my 50th, I don't know. It was. We came home. A friend of ours called and said, I'm making plans for spring training, and I swear I think that was the day before my dad, all of this blew up. So my dad passed away March 2nd. We put my mom in memory care on the 16th, which is a whole other story, and we went to spring training. Well, the, his funeral was the 18th, and we went to spring training the following week. And trust me, that really, really is a good solution. Just get out, do something for yourself, do something different, because I lost my mom March 31st, 2020. We have not had a service. She is not interned with my dad. Mm -hmm. I've talked to the military cemetery he is at. Actually, my husband did. And just hearing what he was saying, I was like, yeah, I will not be talking to them. I need to call the funeral home. But it's just at this point, it's like, it's been so long. It's like, pfft, I'm sure people think I'm just a horrible person. I mean, for a while, okay, we had COVID, but now what's the issue, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I really, really, really wish we could have gone away afterwards because, you know, it was like we came home. It's like, okay, well, mom's gone. We don't have to worry about that. But we haven't really had to worry about her for two weeks because we haven't been able to see her. And, and then you just kind of move on. You just like, it's just like doing the same stuff. And so it's been a lot more of a challenge than I thought. I always thought I would be ready for her to go. And it was a blessing. The timing was good because it would still be a challenge to take her to the park to watch kids. But it's losing somebody during the pandemic is a whole other issue, which is why I'm writing a book about it. I have to keep telling people that to hold myself accountable. So we have been talking, and I've asked you like two of my questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure so, in some ways we probably covered most of the things we wanted to talk about. I think we did. <laughs> so where can people find you? I'll make sure all of your uh, links are in the show notes, but... Give, you, give yourself a shout out because continuing on as 
caregiver to the caregiver, which is what I call myself, is yes. is worth shouting out. All right. And as you can tell, just about everything I'm doing is in my mom's honor and memory. And I think you're doing the same thing. So two places. One would be my website, Cohen, C-O-H-E-N, caregivingsupport.com. And my Facebook community, which Uh-oh. is in most has members in most states, your provinces, and six continents. I haven't found anybody or any penguins in Antarctica yet, but that is <laughs> the Dementia Support Group for Caregivers with Bill Cohen. Yeah, those that would be the be best. Awesome. Okay, well, I'll make sure those are linked in the show notes. And you said you are flying where tomorrow? I am going to Chicago for a couple of baseball games since you brought up spring training. Yeah. Was, was that spring training with the Giants? Yes, it was. And, and I'm not a huge baseball fan but spring training is a special experience that i suggest if you like baseball you will like spring training i just don't suggest three games in two days <laughs> a little too much for me right. the hardcore baseball fans loved it my husband was okay with it i was like can i go somewhere else you yeah, guys watch I, this game i lived in sarasota florida for a while so yes i experienced spring training a bit and even went over to Vero Beach and saw a Yankees Dodgers game. But this weekend is a bucket list from last year. I'm going to finally get to Wrigley Field. I'm going to see the Giants and the Cubs, <laughs> but also I'm going to see my Red Sox against the White Sox. So, and I've never been to Chicago, so I'm really looking forward to it. <laughs> well, hopefully, this is second week of September, almost, yeah, second week of September when we're talking. So, hopefully, the weather is nice in Chicago. It's pretty nice still here in California. I hope it's not as hot as it's been in Oregon. And I will tell my husband to watch that game so he can, like, connect with you in a baseball kind of sense. <laughs> Sounds great. Thank, thank you so much. Yes, it's been a pleasure and an honor. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts. <laughs>